Hello Americans, this is Paul Harvey here to tell you that this is a rebroadcast. So take Paul Harvey's advice when you hear a telephone number, please don't call. Now let's listen to the rest of the show. <laughs> Paul Harvey, good day. Stand by to receive our transmission. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you leave for a while and then you come back and see, I don't, I don't, I don't dread coming back to my job because I, I'm on vacation and I kind of like, oh, I'm gone from the radio. I feel a little sad, but, uh, oh, look, a sea turtle. <laughs> and then I kind of forget about it because I'm on the beach and having fun at Panama City Beach. But that's the way it is with me because I love doing this and mm -hmm. got some great people filling in for me when I leave, you know, and I don't have a problem at all. I wasn't able, I wasn't able to listen. I was just, I was just stuck in the zone. Things happened that way and it was fun, but it's good to be back. Hey, Alan Sanders. Good morning. <laughs> great to, you know what? Great to have you back. Um, oh, it was fun. I enjoyed running it the, last weekend. That was a lot of fun. And Mike came in. It was a lot of fun. But yes. It, it's it's nice for a shakeup. I wouldn't want it to be every week. Well, <laughs> I like hey, I like being I back to normal. I can't jump in anybody else's shoes either because I I just love being here. People are like, oh, I look I don't look forward to going to work. Try your best in your life. And here, here's a little. I'm not Dr. Laura or anything, or I don't give advice. Or I shouldn't. I do, but I shouldn't sometimes. Don't take advice from me, especially about relationships. Well, maybe you should now because I think I've learned. Because uh, you. Keep repeat if you repeat if you have mistakes and you're like, well, take it for someone who's been there. I've mm -hmm. done the wrong thing. Don't do this. Uh, try to find a job in your life that you really love to do. My dad goes, you know, you got two choices when it comes to making a living. I'm like, really, Dad? What's that? He goes, a job or an occupation. He says a job is something you go that you just do and you make money and you can't stand it and you're like, oh, I gotta go work and get money and blah blah blah. Or an occupation is like, I love doing this. But I make a living. I make money doing it too. Mm -hmm. Find an occupation to do because you, you'll be a whole lot more happier. <laughs> because we are, you know, it's you just are. great. There's, there's, I don't care what it is. It's it's totally true. And, and guess what? You'll figure out how to do without some of the things, right? Because you know what? You can't put a price on being happy. Yes. And fulfilled. That's the other thing. You get a sense of fulfillment, and that goes yeah. a long way. Maybe that's why we're so positive. Maybe that's what drives people bananas around us when we're not like. Constantly mad at the world and spitting, you know, people are so vinegar. mad at our positivity sometimes. Isn't that and weird? Why that, Isn't that weird? You can make just people odd thing to rub say. them the wrong way because you're in a good mood. You're such an optimist and, and, and positive. What do you get to be that. happy about? Uh, I don't know my job, my life, my dogs, my career, Several my house, things. my garden, my backyard. What? what <laughs> yeah. should, should I go on? Right. Come on. You know, um, you're lying. <laughs> Betty White, Betty White, I don't know if you ever saw this, but it's funny you should say that. Betty White quoted, was quoted in an interview once, she said that about B. Arthur, you know, the lady that played Maud and Golden Girls with her. They were friends, but B. Arthur goes, sometimes I hate you and your positivity. You're so <laughs> happy all the time, and I hate that. And she goes, and she was very serious with me, and it was kind of like, I'm just taken aback by it. I'm like, Wow. <laughs> It's just funny, you know. And I would, I would. If someone said that to me, I'd kind of laugh. I'm like, really? You're yeah. you're bothered by that? Come on, I mean, be bothered if I'm a bad, horrible, mean person. You would think that you would, would think be the that worst would be thing way. <laughs> to do. <laughs> yes. Now, don't get me wrong. We both had our we have our down days. You know, we get into well, the dumps yes. about some things. Come We're on, human give me a break. Beings. But I, I came from the, uh, the 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 era or the or the the uh, generation or the the school of, hey, you know, complain about it for. 15 minutes a day or something, however long you need to do it. And then and then put it aside, learn from it, and move on. He's, don't mull over it over a month or a week mm -hmm. or something because that's just going to be time lost. You know, I, I, I was mulling over that for a whole week. It got me down for a week, and I wasted that time. You did. It was terrible. So, I, and well, that's I the way you, I live life. And there's a difference between men and women, at least for me and my wife. She's like, I don't know how you do this. We could have been like at at like yeah. the most like we're arguing over something because you do you believe this and I believe the exact opposite and we're like blah 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 blah. You'll walk out of the room. Yeah. Five minutes later, like, so you want to watch a movie? And she's yeah. like, I'm still angry. And I'm like, no. Well, we we hashed it out. We're no. done. And she goes, How yeah. do you do that? How do you just drop it? I'm like, Well, because I'm not going to come redo it. I don't, I don't want to rematch. Yeah. This isn't Rocky Two. We had the fight. <laughs> or, or you three. won. Time yeah. to move on. I, and I've learned that now. Uh, Don Rickles said it. They're like, you know, I think it was either uh, Johnny Carson was asking him a question. He goes, "How do you how do you stay with your wife fifty years? 
How do you stay married to one person for two years? He goes. He goes. We get. We learn to get. We just got to learn to get along. We love each other, and he and we learn. Hey, when you have a problem or a disagreement, it's a thirty minute. It's a thirty minute argument, and then after that, we're done. We move on. It's over. Mm-hmm. He said, "This is don't don't right. let it linger. You know, don't let it it's sit out." The worst out. thing because you end up hurting yourself more than anybody yeah. else. And if you if you got a point, make it or whatever. It's just know that it's some things. What what did my mom say? She goes, "Is this the hill you want to die on? Is yes. this I, like no? I don't want to die yourself. on this hill. <laughs> really? It's a bold strategy. <laughs> it's much more important things that you could die for than that. Right. Come on, to make your point. But I do feel refreshed. I feel better. I do. I, my my time off has to coincide with my beautiful better half. She's a school teacher, and when she takes her time off. Whether it be a holiday or summer break or fall break or whatever they get or or winter break, which is not very long, I'll schedule my time off from whatever I'm doing and go take it with her because it's fine. It's just easy to do it that way. And her and I spend a lot of time together doing stuff, and it and it was great. Panama City Beach, and I don't care where I go onto the beach just as long as maybe it's the Gulf of Mexico, anywhere from the southern tip of Florida all the way around, I don't know, Corpus Christi, Texas, or wherever, however, however big the Gulf is there, and it's a little sea, half sea shape that it is. Hmm. I love the Gulf Shores because they are sugar white sand, 90, 98% of it's white sugar, beautiful sand with blue-green water that you can see. You can stand there and go, oh, I can see my feet at the bottom on the sand. The water is so clear. That's hmm. just, I love that. Certain days are murkier than others, but, but as a rule, that's how it looks. Yeah. And I love that. And there's nothing wrong with the East Coast. It just looks, it's different now because I go to the East Coast and I'm like, oh, it's, it's just, it's a it's the volcanic rock color. It's the it's brown sand. It's just a different earth. Well, it's a different color or whatever. It's, it's just Florida, different. So you still get a lot of white sand, yeah. but you don't get the clear. Right. Not East Coast usually. is different from the Gulf. So and I love and I love that area. We had a good time. We just saw like a four hundred pound sea turtle flopping by. I've never there was a seen drone a real, well, I take that off back. the shore tracking tracking. Unless I was in an aquarium, I've never seen a sea turtle in the wild. I, I just it was the first time I saw one. And it was the only critter we saw. Sometimes we'll either we'll see manta rays, little baby mantas that are about three th- uh, about a, a foot in schools. diameter you know they're flying yeah. along they look like they're flying underwater because mm-hmm. it's like uh, they almost have wings you know it's crazy they're going along but um, we didn't see any the last time. time i was in the gulf which was probably about seven years ago was the first time i had just that momentary freak out because the water is so clear and there was a wave cresting and i saw the shadow of a of, of a large a large fish-like thing something i was like couldn't identify I was like, and my first thought was that's a shark it was a dolphin Oh, because then I saw it pop up, and I was like, oh, "I just saw a dolphin." So for a, for a moment, it was a USO, right? It was like an unidentified, unidentified swimming object. Yes, you didn't know well, what my, it was. My mind, because I saw the the, the dorsal. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, "Oh my god, this is I'm like oh, wait. Cause nope, in a flat. shadow, quick situation, shark and dolphin, you might not could tell the difference because right. everything's in the same place, well, like it, fins it, it, and stuff. Their silhouettes very similar until you realize, well, a shark has a tail that also sticks up, but right. a dolphin has a flat tail. Right, mammal and versus I saw it, I was like, fish. It's like, oh, it's a dolphin. And, and I was like so excited. Be careful with dolphins, too, because dolphins sometimes want to play with you, and they can break a rib when they want to smack you and have fun. Oh, hey, look. Flippers I'd rather coming. play with the dolphin, though. Yeah, I would, too. I have a better chance of uh, surviving. It's BK on there. I, get, I ate a lot, too. Can you tell? Oh, boy, did I eat. We will return after these messages. Me, 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 me. Fun to tickle your tongue with fruit stripe gum. Me, 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 me. <laughs> tickle your tongue with fruit stripe gum. Each pack has different tickly fruit stripe flavors. Cherry stripe, lemon stripe, orange stripe, lime stripe. It tickles your tongue. It's fun. It won't tickle my tongue, Zebra. <laughs> it does, it does. Tickle your tongue with peach nut fruit stripe gum. It's fun. Susie Chapstick has changed her name. Call me Susie Chapstick. Hey, Susie Chapstick. This is real Chapstick weather, so Chapstick is the only name for me. Chapstick lip balm helps keep wind and cold away from your lips. Susie Chapstick! Keeps the natural moisture in. Helps heal chapped lips, too. So when it's Chapstick weather, just remember me, Susie Chapstick. Greetings, fellow classic TV fans. Eight is Enough was a television series that aired from 1977 to 81. The series followed the lives of the Bradford family, headed by newspaper columnist Tom Bradford and his wife Joan, as they navigated the ups and downs of family life. 
Reportedly, the original title of Eight is Enough was supposed to be The Bradford Brood. However, the network executives thought the name sounded too negative, so they suggested the more seemingly optimistic-sounding Eight is Enough. The show was known for tackling serious issues such as drug addiction, teen pregnancy, and racism, helping to establish the dramedy as a socially conscious program. Despite its popularity, Eight is Enough faced controversy when actor Grant Goodeve, playing the oldest son Mark, left the show after the third season due to a contract dispute. The writers decided to kill his character off in a car accident, which upset many fans of the show. However, Eight is Enough forged ahead for two more seasons and remains a beloved classic of American television to this day. This is Pat McCormick with your retro TV trivia from the Golden Rage of TV. You can also find me on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at Golden Rage of TV and on Twitter at Golden Rage of TV One. And now back to BK on the air. There's a magic in the early morning we found When the sunrise smiles on everything around It's a portrait of the happiness that we feel and always will Oh, it is enough to fill our lives Like bright and shiny new dimes If we're ever puzzled by the changing time There's a plate of homemade wishes On the kitchen windowsill And it is enough to fill our lives with Thank you, Pat McCormick, for the Golden Rays of TV. He's cruising right along with a new season of his uh, of his retro uh, retro radio YouTube channel that he has, and he's recently just interviewed, or he didn't recently interview her, but he's recently released the episode of uh, Kathy Coleman, who played Holly on Land of the Lost. You know, the girl with the blonde hair with the little ponytails and stuff that she had, and it's a fantastic uh, interview with her. Check him out. Check out his channel. And you won't regret it. Uh, I did come back from vacation, and I did I did want to do this uh, story because I have a story here from uh, <laughs> Alan and I both love this channel on uh, on out there that's available website social media presence called the Daily Jaws. Mm-hmm. And anytime you know that we can talk about Jaws, we love the movie Jaws. It's just one of the most near perfect films that wound up being that way. Uh, thinking it was going to be a disastrous film, but it accidentally turned into a great film. How great! How fun would that be? You know, it's not coming up where your on movie's going. Forty-eight. I know years. it's incredible, and I have a sto- I have a story here about Jaws because the um, Daily Jaws, and there's another site. It's the, uh, well, it's in the it's in the story here, and I'll tell you. It says Jaws, named as best summer blockbuster of all time. Oh, yeah. And I guess, well, I, I'll agree with that and kind of maybe, didn't I know that already? Or did someone have to decree it that officially? So here it is. Steven Spielberg's shark classic Jaws may be getting a little bit long in the tooth. Who cares, though, when it comes to age? But the 1975 film often regarded as the first ever summer blockbuster. And it is. I mean, remember how we talked about how it's after that they started talking about the summer blockbusters after Jaws came out because it mm-hmm. came out in the summer and blew well, everything away. Think about this. This is how much it's changed. S- movies that were going to be like w- went to summer to die. The yeah. hits were released around yeah. the holidays or the first right, of the yeah. year. There was no such was. thing as the blockbuster tent poles of summer until Jaws. Yeah. They put Jaws out there to go die. Like, okay, yeah. we sunk a lot of money. This is embarrassing. This is going to fail. It's a bad movie. We can Just tell it's put bad. it in June. Right. No one will see it, and it can go away. We can get rid of this kid right. called Spielberg, who everybody thought this was hot. This kid called Spielberg. We can get rid of him. Yep. Turns out, butt. yeah. It reinvented the industry. But everybody's thinking it's summertime. People are going on vacation. They're not going to see movies. That's exactly. how the producers and, and That's Hollywood what they thought. thought back in then. Well, it has been named not as just a great summer block- blockbuster, but the greatest summer blockbuster of all time. That's according to new research commissioned by WatchTVAbroad.com, which looked back at the last six decades of films released between May and August, which <clears throat> happens to be summer if you want to know when it is. <laughs> it compared the box office rankings of these movies and a percentage of their budget alongside their popularity with audiences. 
This is from the U.K., by the way, so this mostly covers how it was in the U.K., but if you've listened to the story, it mirrors what happened here in the U.S. as well with JAWS. Weighting those factors equally, those proportions were correct in showing it was JAWS, which was the clear winner almost five decades after it was originally released. With a modest budget, remember, of roughly $7 million, JAWS made a staggering, now adjusted for inflation, $253 million worldwide, 1975, people, equivalent to a profit of 3514 percent of a profit for a movie the classic shark horror also has a 97 percent rating clearly not high enough for some of us on rotten tomatoes it should have at least 99 percent in my opinion now rounding out the top i want to meet the three percent who are miserable yeah. human who, beings who doesn't <laughs> like just, those three people we, we know they're lying Even they're if trolls you're like, okay the they're violence just, isn't my thing how just, do you look at the movie and go it's bad they're just messing with us right. is what it is they didn't really mean contrarian. that. contrarian i'm gonna not like that's it because right. everyone else let's, does. let's just say it's 100 percent. that's a good one. rounding out the top five are another spielberg classic et the extraterrestrial from 1982 star wars 1977 and the spielberg executive produced back to the future from 1985 <laughs> oh, and The Lion King from 1994. There, we'll throw The Lion King in there, I just saw, Big summer movies. I just saw um, Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster, because like, I, I, we went by just now. Oh, the studio, yeah, by the, the window. It, 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 you did? The the myth, like, I keep hearing of, the, of, of Walt you take, Murray that used to be somewhat you, affiliated did, with did, us. Did you take a photo? I didn't. <laughs> I can't it, prove that it was actually it, here. It, it would be out of. It would be out I of. Can uh, no longer prove. It would Wait, be out of focus. Messi's in studio. It would be out of focus. The if myth. You, if you took a take you the took picture a photo. because we keep hearing that he's out there, but we this don't ever like, actually see him anymore. This, this is like uh, this is like when when you, when Johnny Carson's on, all of a sudden Don Rickles just walks well, in I, unannounced. I would not miss a spooktacular. It's so <laughs> good to be here. Welcome. It's October already. <laughs> It's the 31st. Walt, Walt in the darkness for that. is in the studio. How are hey. you, buddy? I am great. How are y'all? Uh, well, good. I'm d- I think you're reacquainting yourself with the location we, since you got to fill in for me in a couple of weeks. That's exactly okay. right. I, I really so, could yeah. not remember where it was. I, I'm, <laughs> impromptu, and we've got people on cameras over there taking pictures of us and everything. Doesn't she know my claws about photos and money Your and claws? stuff when I, when I take a picture of me and stuff? Yes, the uh, invaluable BK picture. I can't let that out. Yeah. Did yeah. you hear us talking about Jaws just now? Well, I saw it up on your screen as we were going. Yeah, by. We, we were talking about. I was just Jaws. saying, y'all are number one. Is what I that's was. That's what, and I was giving it back. We, yes, we, I saw that. We were, we were pretty sure that's what the thing <laughs> that one finger meant. meant we're number one on the air. Yeah. It wasn't two. It was two individual number ones. That's right. I was saying you're understand. both number one. Yeah, is what two, I was saying. Two, two would mean victory, so he could do that too if he wanted. Well, to. it is. It is the perfect time to talk in, about Jaws. In the V shape, which is any day. But we were talking about, uh, I don't know if you heard, but watch TV abroad. And uh, do you follow on Twitter the uh, the Daily Jaws site? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. This comes from them. It's from the U.K. And we were talking about how much uh, how much of a, of a of a profit Jaws made when it came out. It was 3,514% profit when that movie was That's released crazy. in 1975. Now, Jeff Ricci, I'll get back to the story here, and, and we can talk about it. TV analyst at WatchTVAbroad.com said nearly half a century after its release, Jaws is still as sharp as its famous teeth and has cemented itself as the ultimate summer blockbuster. Now, the research shows that despite a summer season filled with big-budget movies, which include uh, this year, like Fast X, The Meg 2, The Trench. Uh, talk about a make goofy, enough the first Talk time. about a goofy shark movie. Uh, <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which is right around the corner. Mission Impossible 7. Less than a fifth of UK viewers say they are excited to see any of the new summer releases. Well, why doesn't that surprise me this year? Come on. We all know that Jaws was what Americans were spending their summer dollars, and we're here, we know that, on when it was released in that June of 1975. But in the UK, it says it was more of a Christmas release as it didn't hit cinemas there until Boxing Day 1975, more than six months since it opened here. Wow. Now, whether you agree with the new research or not, well, we, we agree with it. We agreed with it before we read it. Since Jaws was uh, first swarmed under the big screen and into our consciousness on June the 20th, 1975, it has changed both uh, going to the beach and cinema forever. And as the re-release of Jaws in 3D and IMAX last year, remember they re-released it last year in IMAX and in 3D, the great white shark swimming offshore of the Amity Island with Brody Quentin Hooper aboard the Orca in hot pursuit will always be at home on a bigger screen. And I loved it because every time I've been able to go see Jaws on the big screen, 
I always see more in movies on the big screen than I do on my television screen. Now, Alan saw it when COVID hit. We were still going to the movies like for five bucks. Yes. Our local theaters were oh, showing yeah, that, old that movies. Great. And when, we, when I went to see Jaws at the Fox Theater in Atlanta, which is a huge screen there, I was noticing, wow, Brody's house. I was noticing all the things hanging in the kitchen in the background, like that, like the pot holders. And it's just stupid stuff in the background that I can't really see close up. On, on home video or on my home screen. So Jaws, again, cemented as a summer blockbuster. And isn't it, though? Yeah. Come on. One, best of all time. And I, so I tell said people, the article. Jaws and Star Wars battle for my number one film of all time. It'll be Jaws. Sometimes it's Star Wars. Sometimes it's Jaws. I can choose either one of those as the most, as my favorite film maybe of well, all time. Well, I think I say this every there. time we talk about that movie, which is one of those movies that every time it's on TV, no matter what part it's on, I'm like, okay, the next two hours. You can, are, you can just take now. it from that point yes, forward. Yes, absolutely. Right. But right. that that one speech on the USS Indianapolis is Robert so Shaw, one of the most amazing. amazing monologues yeah. in film history. I read an article, I think I brought this up when we talked the last time we were talking movies and Jaws. It was, the title of the article was The Most Harrowing Moment of Jaws Has yeah. Nothing to Do with the Actual Shark. That's true. It has everything yeah. to do with the story of an actual historical event. And when you hear it, and you realize it's not just written for the screen. And, and I remember, if you read if you read the Jaws log, right? Yeah, the book. Like, yeah. Audiences thought they wrote that fictionally. And it be, but it had oh. just become declassified when they heard about it, and that's what made them want to incorporate it. Because, you know, they were kind of writing the script as they were filming right. the movie. <laughs> Hor- yeah, horrific right. time for those, those guys sailors. in the water. And, and it was like, yeah, it's a true story. Knowing that I makes met it even some more. of those guys. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, they were on, like, they had a reunion, and I happened to stumble into it. And I was I talked to a couple of the guys for, like, five minutes, and I was like... You guys are the greatest. They were like, no, we just survived. We just had to survive. Yeah. Yeah. And let's give kudos to Robert Shaw in his delivery of the scene. Uh, Across two different filming days. And for Jack Daniels for the help. Didn't do it that well the first time, but he did it again, (laughs) and thank goodness. Go back and watch it. Go back and watch. You can see the moments of one day cut versus the other based on how glassy his eyes are. (laughs) But what what a a thing. So I just had to say that about Jaws because it was a nice article by the Daily Jaws. Check them out and follow them on Twitter. You know, if I like a place, I'll tell you to follow it on social media, and the Daily Jaws is fantastic. Alan said he can't understand where they find some of their stuff. I think it's great. Good thing they do because it's, uh, it's a great site. Jaws, just when you thought it was safe to turn the radio on, I'm back on the air after vacation. <laughs> back home, we got a taxi derby man. He's going to have a heart attack when he sees what I brought him. <laughs> after these messages, we'll be right back. On the city of Tuthopolis' birthday, a cake arrived. But inside were... The cavity creeps! Help, Chris! Quick, the cavity creeps! We'll find them with our fluoride. That's that correct. To help us fight those creeps... Have checkups. Watch street. And brush after meals with... C. R. E. N. T. Yay! It's the Tooneyville Choo Choo. Just drop a record disc in back of the engine and send it on its way. It moves and plays records when you put in the batteries you buy. You play with the Tooneyville Choo Choo and it plays 11 of your favorite tunes. It's the little train that delivers music to all stations. The Tooneyville Choo Choo with four sturdy record discs that play 11 tunes by Tommy. For the commercial, friends, when my room becomes soiled, I use Come Clean, the spot remover with the applicator top. One dab, and it's clean. There. Remember, in my court, it's Come Clean. Now, back to the case. You are listening to BK on the Air on AM 1450, FM 100.3, and online on the TuneIn radio app. Now, back to a guy who'll make you feel really young, mostly because he's so old. It's BK on the Air. Well, you know, old is a relative term, I found out, and the older I get, the more I move that uh, goalpost back a little further. See, yes. I made a sports reference. There you are. I can and you do used that. It, uh, and you did it correctly. I did it correctly. What's wrong with me? Wait I'm a so, minute. I apologize. <laughs> Hold on. I didn't mean to you do that. You know how I always say I feel like I've slipped into some parallel world where everything just changed on me, but I'm the only one who's getting punked? I'm so sorry. I, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Somebody tell the room to stop spinning. <laughs> you really mean to do that. <laughs> 
Well, let's get back on track of the goofiness. I've got, uh, it was time that we do our news flashes of the weird, the strange, and the bizarre and goofy uh, after being gone a week. And I did find a few nice ones out there. I have the first news. Uh, from UPI, of course, a pair of straight... I could put my glasses on because I didn't, <laughs> didn't print this out. See, I'm back from vacation, and I'm like, wait a minute. Why didn't I use uh, 32 font instead of 16? Uh, a pair of strangers with one very special shared interest became co-holders of a Guinness World Record when they got each got 34 tattoos of... You want to take a guess of what they got 34 tattoos of? Hearts. Well, that's... Good guess, but no, it's Marvel Comics characters is what they hold the record for. Canadian comic book fan Rick Scalamero, I hope I didn't butcher his name there, originally earned the the record for the most Marvel comic book characters tattooed onto the body in 2018 with 31 superheroes inked onto his body. Now, a U.S. man, Ryan Logsdon, recently applied to take the record with 34 Marvel tattoos, but while Guinness World Records officials were processing his application, they received word from Scalamero that he had increased his total to 34. The two men are now co-holders of the record. <laughs> Scalamero said that his days of getting inked might be over as he is running out of tattoo space on his body. That's pretty rough. You got a lot of skin. He must be really tattooed. Those must be also big. The only thing's left is my tongue or the inside of my lip. <laughs> Maybe I could get tattooed oh. there, I guess. Uh, Losden said that he might end up adding a few more because he's got a few more spots left. So there you go, Mar- Marvel. Com- you could have worse things tattooed onto your body, I guess, in Marvel comic book That's, character. That's uh, okie dokie. I've got the next news. I don't have a tattoo. I don't either. And I don't plan on getting one. I and was even nothing... in the Navy and yeah, I didn't get a tattoo. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that, uh, yeah, I think there are tattoo types and there are not, and I am not a tattoo type. Mother. Just nothing wrong with it. You could get mother from the Navy on your... <laughs> do, they, do they still do that? Is there, did, you see a, did you see a mother? No, I didn't. Tattoo? No, but when I was in, people were getting like, it's like as soon as I got out of boot camp, they were like, I'm getting my, I'm getting my first tattoo. I'm like, of what? Okay. I don't know of anything I'd want on my body permanently like that. Nope. I don't know. I haven't been able to find th- anything yet. All right. <laughs> From UPI, a tra- uh, transport officials in Maryland confirmed a website address printed on hundreds of thousands of Maryland license plates now redirects to a gambling site based in the Philippines. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, the Maryland Whoops. Motor Vehicle Administration confirmed the War of 1812 license plates, which were the state's default plates from 2012 to 2016, bear a URL that no longer leads to the intended website. <laughs> yep. The plates Whoops. designed by the War of 1812 Bicentennial Commission bear the URL www.starspangled200.org. Yep. Which was originally the website for the Star Spangled 200 Incorporating uh, Commission affiliated nonprofit that raised money for the bicentennial. Right. Residents recently reported the website now redirects to a gambling website based in the Philippines. The MVA estimated the URL is printed on 798,000 <laughs> active Maryland license plates. The administration said it's not affiliated in any way with the website currently using the URL, and the MVA's Information Technology Department is working on options to resolve the issue. And yes, last night, I just checked the site and it still takes you to the gambling well, site. Well, what this when you means is when they, when they bought that website address, <laughs> they didn't think about renewing it. Somebody let it lapse. It became yep. available and someone else decided Whoops. to scoop it up. Wasn't there a controversy about WhiteHouse.com, White, ho- White House, the WhiteHouse.org? Right, there was a WhiteHouse.com. That would take you to for, an unseedy site yes, of some uh, kind a, at a one house point. House of Ill Repute, yes, which some might we'll say, say is very similar to WhiteHouse.gov. By, by the way, I'm going to make a very horrible observation that neither one of us will like. When you and I first, when I first started this show at WBHF, neither one of us wore readers to read things. Stop now it. Now we both have one. I don't one have to. At the same time. Why I do you, choose to. Do you do it just because it looks cool? No, because <laughs> sometimes don't give when, me that. Sometimes when I'm squinting, <laughs> I'm making a point here. <laughs> it's a terrible point, but I'm making it. I don't it. want you making the point. We're both on the uh, reading Can I? readers' glasses. Sorry. What is your what Stay is your on target? What is your magnification on yours? One point five. Oh, mine's one point seven five. So I, I've got I've got a little worse than you. Then okay. Well, you know everybody gets 1. older. 5. Oh, I may have just caused somebody to give us a call. Oh no. About us being old. Let's continue. I got the next news. <laughs> from UPI. 
The annual, this is funny because I chuckled reading this, the annual Cooper, Cooper Hills Cheese Rolling Race in England. Oh, that's yes. on the, that's they on that cheese. show. Yeah. You roll down the hill. In England, yeah. featured the winner of one round getting knocked unconscious and only learning of her victory when she woke up in a medical tent. <laughs> she won. But I, but she didn't know it. The annual event in Brockworth featured multiple rounds of racers stumbling down the steep Cooper's Hill to chase a simulated wheel of double Gloucester, I think as you call it, cheese, to earn a real wheel of cheese as a prize. Delaney Irving, 19, who traveled from Canada to participate in the cheese <laughs> chase, ran in a women only, woman-only round and didn't discover that she'd won the race until she woke up in a medical tent. A video shows Irving nearing the bottom of the hill when she trips and tumbles unconscious across the finish line. Wow. The unusual local sport has a history stretching back to at least 1826, but local legend claims it has, uh, has been as early as the mid-17th century when they did that. I'm winning! I'm winning! <laughs> Did I win? Yeah, you did, but I don't remember it. <laughs> Here, take the cheese. <laughs> you get the cheese. You win the cheese. Uh, I, I always get stuck in a room with someone cutting the cheese, but that's. And I've got the last news. Not in here. Well, wait, not today. Wait, no, wait, no, I don't know not today. Glasses. There's a couple more. Sorry. Hold on. Put on your glasses. <laughs> A Washington, D.C. man is fighting to keep the giant Transformer statues outside his home, and he's involved actors from the franchise in his efforts. Newton Howard, a renowned brain scientist, commissioned an artist to create the massive statues of Autobots, Bumblebee, and Optimus Prime from old car parts back in January of 2021. Optimus well, I guess Prime. while the world was having a cold, he's like, I might as well go ahead and build real life Transformers. I'll be creative. Um, he installed the two of the Transformer sculptures and quickly started receiving complaints from the neighbors. <laughs> Howard's neighbors in Georgetown complained the statues don't match the neighborhood's aesthetic and represent a safety <laughs> hazard due to drawing in a steady stream yes. of visitors seeking photos with the Autobots. But that's what it, really what it is. Yes. We've got too many people that we don't like around no here, Muffy. in doing that. Yeah, well, look at the riffraff <laughs> coming down our street. Thurston. These commoners... <laughs> the statues were a subject of discussion at the district's monthly public safety committee meeting, which was held virtually on Thursday. Howard brought along actors Peter Cullen and Dan Gilvezan wow, to he got speak the big guns. in favor of the artwork. Cullen has voiced Optimus Prime in numerous animated and live TV act or live action Transformers projects, and Gilviz and Gilvezan uh, voiced Bumblebee in the original eighty four through eighty seven Transformers animated series. The public safety committee ruled in favor of the neighbors, saying the statues should be removed. But Howard Aww. said he will still continue to fight to keep the Autobots in place. He said he is prepared to take the case to court. Let me ask you this question, BK. Why do they have a right on his own private property for the neighbors going, well, it's not safe. Well, it's on my property. Right. So well, shut up. As you know as well as I do, if you're in a if you're if you're in a neighborhood, and you actually agree and sign some kind of paper that you're part of oh, an association, an that's true. Yeah, if there's an HOA, but but they're not saying that. Oh, they're we don't saying know that. They went to a well, public safety committee meeting. They're claiming well, it's I'm a not, safety I'm issue. Not for it. Now here, here's the other thing. We're we're looking. We're currently going to be probably moving out of our home and moving into a, a new home probably within the next six years or so. I am looking for land with woods around it, and I am not going to be part of any association. Look, I'm going to be my association. I'm already not in one. <laughs> so and I, we're doing. I'm happy so. about that. I can't do. It. I just think it's great that uh, the guy still talks for Optimus Prime, and he's in his 80s. It's great. He's got a great voice. Just be on the air. Autobots roll out. The Transformers. More than meets the eye. Autobots wave their weapons to destroy the evil forces of the Decepticons. The Transformers. More than meets the eye. The Transformers. Robots in the sky. Attack the Autobot Commander! Call in the Decepticon leader! The Transformers. More than meets the, the eye. The Transformers, sold separately from Hasbro. discover a mountain of taste when you try the cool and crunchy Dairy Queen Peanut Buster Parfait. Or try the rich and creamy smooth Banana Split. All royal treats are on sale now for only $1.89 each. Land of Dairy Queen, we treat you right.
Hey, we're back. It's BK on the air here. Back from my vacation. I'm so glad to be back in here, slipping right back into it like a glove. It's like riding a bike or falling off a bike sometimes compared to when you talk about this show. You can stream online. Go to our website, wbhfradio.org, or download the free TuneIn or Radio Garden apps if you can't hear us close by on the radio. And you can listen to us on those apps no matter where you are. Like if you're on vacation like I was, you can tune us in. Wherever you are. We still got a few more. I got the next news. Strange weird news. This one's interesting because it's from kind of our own backyard from UPI. The Georgia Department of Driver Services issued an unusual reminder for residents taking advantage of the state's new digital driver's licenses and IDs. Here's what they're saying. Quote, please take pictures with your clothes on. Unquote. <laughs> You've got it, mister. Please. Please. It's always the wrong ones who want to do it. The department said in a Facebook post that residents are being asked to ensure that they are keep things classy when snapping selfies for their digital licenses and IDs. See, I didn't even know they were doing that. I knew you could renew them, but I didn't know that you could take your own photo. And it's, maybe you can actually smile now. You can do that, but without a shirt or with a shirt. Which This which allows Apple Wallet users to leave their physical copies in their wallet uh, license. Wow, then, that you can show through a TSA checkpoint through through that app. Mm-hmm. Uh, your driver's license. That's cool. I did not know that. Quote, attention, lovely people of the digital era, the post reads. Please take pictures with your clothes on when submitting them for your digital driver's license and IDs. Unquote. Thank you very much. Now, it was unclear whether the reminder was prompted by some resident failing to follow the advice or what, but, but they did put it out there. So there you go. I didn't know. Maybe I'll do that next. Well, I won't do that, but I'll do I'll do the take my picture, you know, with my clothes on. But I didn't know you could do that. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. I wonder if I could put any kind of shirt on I wanted or whatever. I don't know. I'd be kind of weird. I guess. I've always wanted my picture taken a little bit blurry and a little glassy-eyed, so that way when I get pulled over late at night, they go, oh, that's what you normally yeah. look like. Okay. Why don't you just take it after the pub crawl? Exactly. <laughs> take it right out of the- I'll send that picture. This is what I look like all the time. Well, Mr. Sanders, this looks just exactly like you. Be on your way. Yes. Thank you. Have a good time. Oh, okay. That is Maybe you. don't have a good time. All right. I've got the last news this time. It's for real the last one. Just fooling earlier. I was. I was playing you. <laughs> Los Angeles home, or the Los Angeles home made famous by exterior shots in the TV series The Brady Bunch, has gone on the market for an asking price of $5.5 million. Wow. Yeah. The Brady Bunch house, which was previously sold to cable network HGTV in 2018, served as the family's home in exterior shots of the 1970s comedy, while scenes set inside the home were filmed on a soundstage. HGTV aired a series of specials that featured the inside of the house being remodeled into a replica of the show's interior set. The listing says the home will be sold fully furnished with Brady-inspired items, including a green floral living room couch and a 3D-printed replica of the series horse sculpture. I start to say, is the horse going to be down there in the living room? That's yep. perfect. They can and, 3D uh, print that now. Mrs. BK and I watched that entire, I think it's been two or three years now, since HGTV bought the house mm-hmm. and made an entire show out of it, which included the cast of the of the kids from Brady Bunch. I need now. to go check that out. And they were supervising, they were helping demolish it and redo it and redesign it and, and help track down. They went and tracked down all these things that were on the set, like at these thrift stores and stuff, and trying to reproduce exactly the furniture which from whatever season, because it changed from time to time. And the house, the way it was made, was not... You, there's no way you could make the house the, the in the the real house look like the one in the television show look because it just it had the one in the show had two levels and it went back here and the kitchen was over here and it was totally wrong. They did they adapted they added on to it they altered that entire house to mirror exactly how it looks in the television series, including the bedrooms I guess and the and the kitchen and the and the living room with okay. the staircase. Probably one of the most popular staircases in TV sitcom history. Put was that yourself one. in that mindset for a moment. Imagine that you could buy that house. And how it would feel every day. <laughs> Talk about nostalgic geekiness. Oh, yeah. Every day you're like, I'm living in the actual Brady Bunch house I, now. Not just exterior, yeah. but also interior. I thought, I, I, I felt when I would watch it as a kid, I'm like, it would make me feel, wow, those they're really rich. They're well off. Look how big that house is. And there's six kids. And he's an architect. And mom doesn't work. And she's at home. And they have a maid named Alice right. that does 
everything, include that doesn't live here anymore, include butting into their lives about everything. <laughs> so it goes on with them vacations and stuff. And there's a Grand Canyon episode. And there's a, where they go to Hawaii in an episode. And right, Kings Island amusement park. Amusement I mean, it was park? great. You know, and it was a great show. Grew up watching it. Still catch it from time to time. But uh, I think that's cool. Of yes, I would love to own How, a piece of nostalgia like that. Would be like so that. wild. It'd be like uh, it'd be like redesigning your house to look like the inside of the poltergeist house. Oh yeah, yeah. And you, like, did I ever this tell is you the craziest thing? Did I ever tell you I looked that one up? I looked the because um, the poltergeist house the that exterior? they yeah I I looked up where it is, and and I went on Google Maps because you know with the cameras and stuff with Google now you can look at everything and went right to the front of it and looked at it and it still kind of looks exactly the same and whoever lives there probably gets the occasional person coming by with the photo the or hey you're in the poltergeist you better get out of that house it's going to demolish itself it's going to collapse at the end and it's still there wait it came back but uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, if you want to go look at the Brady Bunch house, where's the news flashes? Do you have them still, or did I you give them to me? You. Did I throw them away? Yes. I don't know what you did with them, but I handed it back. If you, if you, I went to see it. If you want to, I think I put it at the end. If you want to go see the house, the Brady Bunch house they used for the exteriors and the ones that he just talked about on the the news flash, it's at one one two 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 Dilling Street, Studio City, California nine one six zero two. That's actually the address. It's near like the end of a. Not at a cul-de-sac, but it's like near the end of the of the neighborhood that it's in. Because hmm. on the BK Hollywood tour that we did in 2017, where we went out to L.A. and run around, that was one of my locations. I did a live video was for the right in front of it. That's before they'd done any of that. It was still was someone was living in it, and HGTV had not got a hold of it or anything. And they had to add a, a window to the front of it, even back when the Brady Bunch was on. There was no window on the parts. So they had to fa- had to hang a fake window out on the left side when you're looking at it on the corner of the. The, the awning down below it. But, yeah, hmm. the iconic house. A lot of iconic houses in television. The Brady Bunch house, Little House on the Prairie was always recognizable. The little wooden house that sat there with the little barn shack out to the side. And we know Michael Landon destroyed all of that when it was over. You, you He blew the entire setup with dynamite when the show was over. I did not know that. Because uh, we wrote it, I think it was, I think it was Wait, the last why? episode. Well, he didn't want it to be used in any other productions from the production company. He goes, they're not. this is our set, this is our show. He felt very close to that show. He goes, listen, I'm not going to let them reuse any of this. So the last episode, I think someone's going to, what was the plot of the last episode? Someone bought the town. They all had to move at the end because mm-hmm. someone bought the town, bought them out because they were making a mining thing out of it or something. I don't know what they did. But uh, they blew it up. They blew the entire, all the sets up, uh, every building destroyed them before the show went off or after the show wow yeah i mean that's that's crazy and i've seen that one you're never too old to not learn something new (laughs) i had no i don't know on this show if it's worth learning anything or not 770-386-1450 is our number let's go to the phone just bk on there hello yeah yeah i got a question hey it's eric hey eric what's your question no it's Terry como (laughs) he's dead i got a question for you and he Go is back dead. to that news flash story about the Optimus Prime and the Bumblebee. Transformers, yeah. Now, are, is it any, are any of these people born in the 80s? Is what now? Are any of these people born in the 80s? Any who people? The people that, are, the people that outlawed this. I have no idea that, well, the Public Safety know. Commission in that town are the ones who know. said that it's not a safe thing to leave okay, and they need to take it down. I'm going to take a guess that they are not they're very old and were probably born in the 1930s. Yeah, they must be old. Because uh, <laughs> and grumpy. Anybody was born in the 80s, they rise up against that. They really would. Yeah, the rise of the Transformers. No, oh, Eric, I, I'm going to have to disagree. There's Some a, might there's not. There's a lot of people who think that their little neighborhoods are their own kingdoms and they rule it that way. That's and they, true. They impose well, their will. Guess what? Yeah, it could go either way. Well, guess what? Mm. We are the child of children of the 80s, and we rise up. <laughs> Sounds like the name of a Transformers it, it, it episode. Make sense. It does. Rise of the Transformers. Tra- rise of the Transformers. Yes, or Terminator. Rise it does of the not Shores. make sense. Come on. Well, this, people will do that. Uh, hey, I, Eric, I'm with you in the one respect. It's on his own personal property. If there are HOA uh, rules against that and he signed a contract, that's one thing. But yeah. they're not going to an HOA. They're going to a public safety meeting, yeah. and they're saying, well, because too many people are coming down the street, it's a safety hazard. Well, you know what? Oh, please, Tough. let it go. And okay, and don't get me wrong. I know why some of those HOA things are there. If you're in a neighborhood, they don't want people to have a home that's dilapidated and it's 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 right, the grass the grows up, up and they got junk cars in it and it just looks horrible and it looks like the Adams family or the Munsters or on something. That'd hand, be cool though. On the other hand, but yeah. think about the economy. Now that he might could help. Charge, yeah. He could charge people for taking pictures. <laughs> 
Uh-huh. Yeah, I guess you could. Yeah. Now, now, and Universal might have a problem with that. No, these, these politicians don't think about stuff like that. Well, no. everybody's putting their nose in somebody else's business, and I, I this don't is like not that. Normal. This, er, Eric, is this America? Eric, who's your favorite Transformer? If you had to choose one, what's your favorite one? Okay. What? <laughs> I'm gonna go. I said what he's he's getting old know, and hard of hearing. He's getting cranky. I said, what was your favorite Transformer? Just tell me. I'm us. gonna we guess it's know. Optimus Prime. Optimus Prime. There's some and, and I'm not a big Transformers fan, never was, but there's something to me where like, hey, uh this Transformer transforms what? into oh, a man, what did you say? I said I'm not a big Transformers fan. I never never liked he's, them. He said well, that before. Free. But 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 the but here's the thing. If I'm gonna pick one, I'm going to pick one. Oh, look, this guy turns into a F-14 fighter jet. Oh, look, this one turns into a boombox stereo. Oh, look, this one turns into that. To me, turning into a tractor trailer is just not very impressive. Basically, I don't know why. Eric, you know what he's saying. He prefers to side with the enemy. I like, what is it, Starscream that turned into the Star jet? Starscream? Yeah, he was cool. Why are we friends? I'd rather be friends with <laughs> I often Alex. ask myself that question. <laughs> Hey, exactly what I'm saying. Hey, Eric. Why are we free? Hey, Eric, did you know that the radio station here in Cartersville that I used to work at was a Transformer? It transformed into a, an auto museum. Yeah. <laughs> it did. Sorry. All right, buddy. Why are we free? We, I just want to know. We're, uh, we're, we're going to go to a break, and you go just take a, take a breath. Take a breath. I have some water. Take my okay. Go watch a Transformers movie. <laughs> right. Not the movie. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. So I like the animated movie. Uh, yeah, the animated movie. Well, didn't Leonard Nimoy do a voice? Yeah, on the he animated did the movie? voice yeah. of Omicron. I, a lot of people were introduced oh, wait, to no. A lot of people were That's introduced to now. death with that movie. Somebody died, and they'll never forget it as a kid. It's BK on the air. After these messages, we'll be right back. Break open the mind. Refreshing breath savers. The blue in the middle breath mint that's sparkling fresh and sugar free. Break open the mint that's clean and brisk. A breath that's fresh enough to kiss. Break open the breath savers. The Bisco. And here is G.I. Joe with Kung Fu Grip. G.I. Joe has hands that grip. Fingers you hold open and let close. Hands that hold on with a Kung Fu grip. The grip you help Joe use in self-defense. G.I. Joe with Kung Fu grip. The hands that grip. Stand by to receive our transmission. Hey, we're back. It's BK on the air. Before we went to a break, we were talking little Transformers, man. And it was, and again, I admitted it. It was something that I didn't watch as a kid because I, I think the Transformers came in when I was, you know, just get. I was already out of high school or getting out of high school. I had a car and places to go on Saturday, and I didn't. I didn't watch the Transformers because I was getting older. I didn't watch. Uh, and we talked about this. The '80s version of GI Joe. My version of GI Joe was fuzzy head beard. G.I. Hmm. Joe from the 70s, the big 12-inch action figure, 8-inch or however they, however big they were. They were 12-inch. That's, yeah. what, that's what I remember G.I. Joe. The Adventure Team Joe is what I had. So I didn't – and G.I. Joe became – they they'd, they took away him being a person in the 80s and turned him into it. That was the team name. There was no G.I. Joe guy named G.I. Joe. It was just the Team Joe, which was fine. But I never – that came in later, and I – and I just didn't get into that. Well, I, I got something here for Eric and you. You were talking on the break about I didn't know that Scatman Crothers did a a voice yeah. on G, on uh, the Transformers. That's why I always loved the character of Jazz. As Jazz. So here, this is from the animated show that I'm sure everybody that did like it remembers. Autobots transform. <laughs> hey, I'm stuck. I can't transform. Ow! Thanks. I think. <laughs> Optimus Prime giving me a little kick there to get him to transform. He's like, oh, you kicked me. Thanks, I think. And I talk about another guy who everything that he did we loved. Scatman Crothers was great. I mean, he was a great singer, performer uh, on sitcoms, on movies. I mean, whether it be Sanford and Son, Spots, uh, Harlem Globetrotters, he did voices for oh, yeah. Transformers. Uh, he was in The Shining for Stanley Kubrick. Uh, he uh, he played the he played the trash man and Chico and the man. That's where I remember him from. He come by. He was the trash, the garbage man that came by on the sitcom uh, Chico and the Man with uh, Freddie Just, Prinze and uh, Jack Albertson. He came from that vaudeville school of you could do everything: yeah, sing, do, dance, act, and he comedy. Could. He could improv. 
and you get a chance to look it up on uh, YouTube. And if you're familiar with the show anyway, you won't have to look it up because you'll you've already seen it. He did a guest spot on uh, Sanford and Son, and his name on Sanford and Son was Fred's old old buddy coming to see him. His name was Bowlegs. Oh, Bowlegs is coming to see me, and he did because Scatman Crothers had Bowlegs, and he was he was his buddy that did they danced and stuff and sang get that nickname because he would. That, 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 that kind of singing where you're not using real words, you scat. What, did they get it from him? And is that why he became I don't know known it, as Scat Man? I don't know if it or was around. Or is it because around... he took it from the guy who invented that? I don't know. I don't I know remember, if it was. This is one of those things where there's too, too many things in Was my it head. around before him? I don't know. And call that. I I'm remember sure. the story. Somebody was in the studio recording, and they dropped their sheet music, so they lost their words. And they were trying to pick it up, but they didn't want to lose the recording right, session. Right. So instead of singing the words, the guy was like, zip, ba, ba, da, da, ba, da, it's, it's, it's the tone the words would have been in. It was just gibberish. Just gibberish <laughs> nonsense that became known as like scatting. That's and funny. I think maybe he kind of took that the next step. And, and then they started like calling it that. It could be, well, maybe we should research, do something called maybe, research. Maybe I might if research we had a box, that. we could look I'll that up. research <laughs> that and find out and see what happened. It'd be nice to know. It tells me, you goose-stepping but, morons. Uh, <laughs> stay Thanks. You know, ever since Sean Connery got those false teeth in the late 70s, his, his talk changed, but it was okay. It tells me that goose-stepping morons like yourself should try reading books instead of burning them. Today on this day in history, June the 3rd, 1940, the last British and French troops evacuated from Dunkirk on this day in history, June the 3rd. Uh, you want to watch re- two really good movies based on what they did with the Dunkirk incident in England? Uh, you can watch the newer one called Dunkirk by Christopher Nolan. Uh, I actually saw that in a theater. It's a very wonder. It's a true story. It's amazing mm-hmm. what a true story that is. And you can also watch a movie from the fifties, uh, from the forties, that won an Academy Award called Mrs. Miniver. And it's based. It's about a, a woman and her family who actually was part of it and helped them help. Uh, they found a German spy in London, and then they helped uh, volunteer their own boats to go get them and, and bring these soldiers back uh, from uh, from where they were and back to their the homeland of mm-hmm. England. And it's a Mrs. Miniver is another really good movie, uh, Academy Award winning movie about that. 1946, on this day in history, the first bikini bathing suit was displayed in Paris for the first time. The bikini. <laughs> and I always make fun of it. Well, I don't make fun of it, but I make the dis- comparison. 1946, same year the bikini came out, same year we started broadcasting here at WBHF, and my mom came into being and was born in 1946. All three of those things are the same age. Good year. My mom, and everybody's like, thanks, I just got a... a, a Vision in my head of my mom in a bikini. No, that's not what I meant to do, so (laughs) I'm sorry. Today on this day in history in 1949, Dragnet is first broadcast on the radio on KFI in Los Angeles, California. Jack Webb's phenomenal radio show that everyone remembered and tuned into eventually went on to spawn a series in the 50s. Then it went off the air for a couple of two or three years and came back in 1964, I think, or five as a new color series. And just kept going because it was a fantastic story based on true stories of of what of police stories in the Los Angeles Police Department and around the United States. And that's why he ended that whole show with, the following story you see is true. The name is changed to protect the innocent. I'm like, yeah. They may have changed it around a little bit, but it's amazing some of those things really happened. I'm like, really? Did they have a guy dressed up as a clown robbing banks? <laughs> that must have really happened because they used that, I guess, in one of the episodes. Which was great. And to me, it's one of the best police detective type series that was ever put on uh, television because I loved Dragnet and still catch it from time to time. Uh, On this day in history in 1969, a classic television series aired its final episode. What does your telepathic mind tell you now? I believe you. Agony will soon pass as it has for me. Oh, give it up. I shall not withdraw a single charge that I have made, and I shall do everything in my power against you. It is mutiny! Dr. McCoy, sorry, but I'm going to have to take you off the case. On this ship, my medical authority is final. I won't allow it. It's done. Security guard! Attention all personnel. First Officer Spark has been placed under arrest on the charge of mutiny. Then, Doctor... That's the time we move against him. We'll have to take over the ship. We're talking about mutiny, Scotty. That's enough. We know what was said. Enough to convict you of conspiracy with mutineers. And you're so charged. The sentence, death. Execution will be immediate. 
That's right. The last episode of Star Trek, Turnabout Intruder, premiered on this day in history on NBC. It was about a, a lady who, uh, a jilted lover by Kirk, got revenge on him. She invented this machine or found this machine that would actually, when Kirk was trapped by this uh, mechanical device, it transformed her entire soul and being into his body and his his soul and being into her body. And he, she, she trapped oh, Freaky him in, Friday. Yeah, it was like a Freaky Friday before it happened. And she, in turn, wanted to become a captain and take over the Enterprise and do evil things. And he had to find some way, as a woman, to convince Spock and McCoy that it's really him. Because mm-hmm. it's, ty- it's the only time in Star Trek history that Captain Kirk in the original series was played by somebody else. Or he was playing somebody else at that time. So it was kind of interesting that uh, he was playing another character in that. Not the best episode to go out on. It was okay. It wasn't a big bang. <laughs> oh, it sounded great. But they didn't. Uh, they didn't go out on a bang because they found out they weren't renewed, and they never had a final episode to wrap up the series like some people get. It just stopped. And yeah. It was over. But boy, did it go on to do a whole lot more once it hit syndication and grown in popularity. Because it was never a big ratings hit when it was out. We got more on this day in history when we come back. It's BK on the air. Men and women probing the unknown blackness of space. Worlds beyond imagination lie before them. Star Trek, tonight at 8.30, 7.30 Central Time on NBC. Delicious. And dangerous. First, never touch any appliance without a parent's supervision. And always be careful with kitchen appliances. Keep their cords out of your way and your fingers out of their way. Also, always turn pot handles in, away from the edge of the stove. So nobody bumps into them and gets hurt. Now you're cooking. What is that? What's what? Sounds like sirens. Yeah, I guess so. Well, you don't usually hear sirens in the countryside. (laughs) Sounds like a lot of them. Must be a fire someplace. It sounds like you're headed this way. I know what it is. What? It's the phone company. They know what I did here today. <laughs> They're coming to get me, man. Oh, paranoia. Listen, this... this wake up, sucker! This is the phone company we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, they see everything. They know everything. They got their own covert police force. <laughs> I'm probably wired for sound right now. I gotta get out of here. Johnny! Don't use my name! <laughs> BK on the air. Now back to a guy who put me through a lot of pain in childbirth. I'm his mother. I should know, but I love him anyway. It's BK on the air. Hey, we're back. It's BK on the air here on AM 1450 and 100.3 FM WBHF. You can stream us online at WBHFradio.org. You can also listen to the show. I turned it into a podcast. As I get it up as quick as I can uh, after I'm off the air on Saturday. I try to edit everything together and make it sound a little differently for podcasts. But you can catch my own YouTube channel that I have, BK on the Air. And you can also uh, check me out on Spotify for podcasters, Spotify and SoundCloud. So there's two or three places you can find me out there. The best is just to go to YouTube because YouTube is the place to be. I want to continue on this day in history. June the 3rd. Is it already June? It is already June. 1973. My Love by Paul McCartney and Wings was number one on the Billboard chart. And the number one movie in the box office in 1973, High Plains Drifter by Clint Eastwood. So there you go. There's two things 50 years ago in 1973. And not a bad song. So we had a good song that was number one and a good movie that was number one. I mean, I learned about, I knew about Paul McCartney and Wings before I even knew who the Beatles were as a kid. Listening really? To say, yeah, because I was listening to 70s music, and I'm like, Wings was big in the 70s, so I actually, I think, discovered them through him, which I think some younger people did. I got some Queen stories, the group Queen. Uh, this is the first one, 1976, Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody goes gold on this day in history, and that's the first milestone. I think it went on to be super duper platinum or whatever it kept going and it was a very popular song i don't know if it ever went that far but it went gold on this day and uh, hey we got a leftover from may when we were talking about may the 5th which is star wars day or whatever did you know that may the 5th 
Uh, did you ever play the Vector game, the Star Wars game, where you're in the yeah, X-Wing fighter? It. There was, you know, oh, Vector yeah, winning line. That, that movie was released on May the 5th as well. Atari released that in, in the arcades, that cabinet game. And I'm like, man, I, I was addicted to that game. I loved it every time I could chance to play it. Star Wars Day is May the 4th. Right, but May 5th was the day. The day that the May Star Wars the 5th, game came out. May the 5th is when it came out. It was the day after that. That's right. Yeah. The, 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 but, the, hey, it could have been out in some of the stores up in the 4th. Right? I just know <laughs> I wasted a lot of quarters trying to pull oh, I did the too. desktop. I did, too. And I loved how I you heard better, the actual voices yeah. from the movie. Oh, yeah. You're all clear, kid. It was great. 1988 on this day in history, June the 3rd. Big, the film Big, directed by Penny Marshall, starring Tom Hanks, premiered in the U.S., and today on this day in history, another movie premiered in 2011. X-Men First Class oh. opened on this day, which was a great X-Men movie. I love that film. Uh, Matthew Vaughn, is that who directed it? Yeah, he's a great, he did a great job with the X-Men. I always thought he'd do good with Superman if he ever took over Superman. But we'll see what James Gunn does. Birthdays on this day in history. Today, June the 3rd, Tony Curtis, actor, uh, died in 2010, his birthday today. That's Jamie Lee's dad. Uh, Chuck Barris, the TV game show producer and the host of The Gong Show and many other games that he produced, uh, he died in 2017. Can I just say that The Gong Show was probably one of the most goofy, stupid thing that I've ever seen, but stupid was never more fun to watch than The Gong <laughs> Show. I really was a big fan of The Gong Show. Today is Do John Dykstra's birthday today, Amer American special effects supervisor and producer. He's the guy that uh, worked on Star Wars and came up with a lot of those models for the uh, fighter ships and stuff, along with Joe Johnston, and then went on after that to uh, come up with a show called Battlestar Galactica, which George Lucas did not appreciate, and they sued him over and stuff. So, And I was surprised to see him in that industrial, that light and magic uh, documentary, on documentary Disney Plus. after they parted ways so horribly, and they actually talked about each other. Maybe they've made up a little bit since then. I don't know. But uh, talented guy, Dr. John Dykstra. Um Today is Susan Quattro's birthday. That's Susie Quattro to a lot of people, American rock singer and bassist. And buddy, she had a she was a she's a great rocker. She did, she had a hit called Stumbling In in the seventies, and she played Leather Tuscadero on Happy Days, Pinky Tuscadero's uh, little sister <laughs> on Happy Days. She always snapped her fingers and pointed like you know gun pointing with her finger that was her thing and today is actress and model imogene poots birthday today i have no idea who she is but i just like saying her name imogene poots <laughs> why not it's her birthday hey miss poots how you doing i'm okay quit making all that noise <laughs> It's always National Something Today. Today is National Trail Day. So if you can get out there and walk the trail, which is what I'm doing exactly. I think right when I get off the air today, me and the better half are going to go out and hit hit the trail. Hey, go hit the trail, buddy. That's what we're going to do is go hit the trail today. Today is National Something She Hates, by the way. Today is National, but I love it. Today is National Egg Day. Buddy, is there any more perfect food than the egg? There is no Come more on. perfect you food. You can do so many things with it, fix it so many ways, and put it in so many things. But my, my wife only likes it used in an ingredient. She will never eat an egg by itself in any shape, form, or so fashion. So wild. My wife has, can force herself. She's like, I really? got to cook really? it really hard, <laughs> almost to where it's brownish burnt wow. with a lot of other stuff in there. Oh, geez. But wow. she goes, I know I need to eat eggs because they're so good for you. Yeah, yeah. So and she forces herself. I, I can eat them runny, sunny yeah, side up. I can eat them in an omelet, I, scrambled, fried. I oh. can eat them as a hard-boiled egg, soft-boiled <laughs> egg. At home, the only way I can eat a, a fried egg or a sunny side up egg where I can break the yolk and sop it up with a piece of toast like I oh. usually do, I have to be by myself. I can't do it while she's there. That's oh forbidden. God. That's forbidden not to do it you by myself. You gotta have a runny yolk. Oh, I oh love my that. God, yeah, that's the best. It's great. Yeah. Mm. Eggs are great. Eggs are wonderful. And today is a uh, repeat day today. So that's cool. Did today, you know today is, is repeat day today. It is. Did you also know today is repeat day? Did you know? I didn't know this. Every first Saturday is not only National Play Outdoors Day, which is oh, today, yeah, yeah. but is also every Saturday apparently is National Trails Day. Well, that's so right. Well, they both go every, hand in every hand. Every first Saturday. It's, yeah, exactly. So go out and play outside on the trail. Go outside and rock a trail. Hey, when we were kids, we went out and played, and guess what? We were getting a lot of cardio exercises, playing our hearts out, because we were distracted because we were playing. Mm -hmm. And and that's how, that's how it is. So that's how I do it now as, a, as an adult it if has I can, to be if i can I trick can't. myself into having fun while i'm working out and doing something i'll do it but but to sit on a treadmill and walk yeah, I, I can't, can't do it i can't I'm not doing that even when i could run i would choose to run like playing soccer because now i'm playing a game i couldn't yeah, just say you're having fun i would go run for five miles why no 
<laughs> no way. I can't. Well, do it's it. good for you. Uh, but there's nothing. Uh, but if yeah. I play soccer or basketball or whatever, just screwing around and I'm working that and, heart rate up. And back when I did do the treadmill thing many years ago and tried to do it, I put you know something in front of it like a television. I'm like, if I watch this entire hour program, I'm spending an hour on the treadmill. And I'm like, I just I feel too much like a hamster on a <laughs> treadmill. I'm like, I don't want to be a hamster just running along nowhere. You know, I just, I just don't want to do that. So if I'm riding a bike with someone uh, here locally, we have a huge huge trail which was converted from a railroad track into a trail in Cobb County which goes all the way out of metro Atlanta Cobb County uh, suburbs all the way to the Alabama state line it's called the Silver Comet Trail because that's what the railroad line was called and it runs the whole like many miles from Atlanta to, to Alabama line and that trail is it's it's uh, it's concrete paved the whole way so you know we'll pitch we'll sp- pick out parts of it just to go hit sometimes, and it's for the most part pretty steady. It has some little hills and whatever because you know train tracks. I learned this growing up. I'm like I'm, I thought one day I'm like why don't trains can trains go up hills? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I always look and I'm like there's never hills where there are tracks. There are small inclines up and down, but there's only a certain degree that a train can go up before it wheels its metal wheels just start spinning. That's why you don't see a train climbing a mountain because they can't. If they do do that, it's it goes around in a circle up the mountain like this, kind of flat. Right. Like the train's flattened out, but it has a to make gradual complete ascent. rotations to go up that thing. And I didn't even think about that. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. So that's the Silver Comet Trail. A little plug for that thing that we walk a lot. So, yeah, get out. Move more. Eat less. Yeah. Or if you eat more, move more. Move, <laughs> to make up for even it. even so, more. Yeah. I got this story off Variety.com. A uh, classic sitcom star and talk show host himself is having some problems. Danny Bonaducci from the Partridge family. He's going to undergo brain surgery for a neurological disorder after visiting 100 doctors, the story said. And I didn't wow. know this about this week. And I heard that he'd had problems a few, like a month or two ago, but I don't know what it was. Former Partridge family star... And star of the Danny, Bonnie, Danny Bonaducci show radio host has revealed to his fans that he will be undergoing brain surgery after being on a difficult health journey. In a recent interview with TMZ, Bonaducci explained after visiting 100 doctors, he says, and going through a period of time without a diagnosis, he's been diagnosed with a neurological order that is also referred to as water on the brain. Bonaducci described for TMZ that during that upcoming operation, the surgeons will place a shunt in my head and a drain board to remove the liquid from his brain. Oh. While Bonaducci remains hopeful for the potential relief the surgery could provide, he admits he will be completely bummed out if this doesn't work. Those are his words. He says, I'd rather be safe than sorry. I don't want to get my hopes up too much uh, that it'll be cured, unquote. He goes, I can't walk currently. I just can't. I cannot walk. I'm never going to run track, never going to box again, but I can get if I can get from here to there to my own kitchen on my own, bravo. As for what caused the condition, Bonaducci isn't quite sure, but he believes his earlier behaviors and activities could be factors. Quote, I've done so many stupid things, he said. I took a guitar to the head. That hurt, and that was possibly the cause of all of this at one point, unquote. He also said, I got punched in the face by a Jose Casaneo, a 265-pound professional athlete. And by the way, I didn't hit the floor. I guess it didn't knock him out. In addition to starring as Danny Partridge, as we know in the Partridge family, Bonaducci also appeared in Monk, Girlfriends, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And <laughs> later on in his career, fought, as he said, as a boxer and wrestler. Some of all of that might be factors on why he's having problems with his brain or having a brain injury. Didn't he wrestle? Um, was there a famous bout between him and Donny Osmond back in the day? I need to look that up. I think that was in the early 90s. He he wanted to box Donny Osmond. And I don't. I, I don't know, I, I I don't don't know who won know. or whatever, but it was like a publicity stunt thing or something like that. So, But, uh, again, you come down in camps on TV shows. You and I talk about Munsters versus Adam's family. Mm-hmm. We talk about uh, peanut butter, chocolate, Reese's peanut butter, butt cups. You were either one or the other. Well, in the 60s and early, well, in the early, late 60s, early 70s, it was Pat Parker's family versus Brady Bunch. They were kind of the two competing and i was more brady bunch i watched the I'm brady definitely bunch. team brady bunch. i didn't watch the partridge family a lot so I, I i i can't talk a lot about the show but i did see it from time to time and they're based on a real family group called the cow sills a family of the bomb sings with the kids and the group the cow sills from the 60s is who they're based on which is a true story it's big down there we're going to have more and i got some more stories coming up when we come back we'll return after these messages going on. Yes, something funny's always going on with the Brady Bunch. 
in cherry, grape, and orange. Pop Rocks! Taste as they! Pop Rocks! The Cracklin's What's Happening? WBHN! Hey, we're back. BK on the air here having a great time as usual. I got a story here that came out this week and I had no idea that this was going on with the catalog of one of my favorite rock groups, Queen. I mean, come on, Alan, did they have a bad song? Nope. I don't remember a really bad... I remember some goofy songs in the 80s they did that sounded very 80s, but hey, they still were a snap your fingers, uh, popular song that hit the charts from Variety.com. How real is Queen's billion-dollar catalog deal that's going on? After months of murmurs, news broke just before the long Memorial Day weekend that according to unnamed sources, the surviving members of Queen were in the process of closing... Uh, it says closing a deal for the legendary group's catalog for a mind-boggling $1 billion. Universal Music Group, the world's largest music company, was said to be the likely buyer. Three sources tell Variety the deal is in advanced stages, although another close another close to the situation says it's very preliminary and that the billion-dollar price tag is real, quote-unquote. However, exactly what is included in the package is not entirely clear at this point. The deal is universals to lose, two sources say, although Sony Music is said to be waiting in the wings as well. They're sitting there, Sony's like... <laughs> Hey, well, we, we, we want it. Owing to, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. owing to the company's longstanding relationship with the group, which signed with EMI in 1972 and remained with the company, which was acquired by Universal in 2011 throughout its career. However, in 1991, it signed a deal with Hollywood Records for U.S. and Canadian recorded music rights only, which led to a later acquisition by the company of those assets, and therein lies one of the complicating factors. If true, the acquisition would dwarf the largest such deals on record, which include Bruce Springsteen selling his published and recorded music to Sony back in the day for a reported $600 million, and Bob Dylan selling his published works to Universal for a price said nearly to be $400 million. Biggest of all, sources told Variety in February that the Michael Jackson estate is in the process of selling half of the late singer's music catalog to Sony, and an unspecified financial partner, although that deal apparently has not closed at the time of this article's publication. How do you sell? Which? How do you choose what half of Michael's stuff to sell? That's so weird to break it up into halfsies. Oh well, Sony owns this half, but they can't play Billie Jean, but they can play Beat It. How do you? How do you do that? They own both sides. I think you do that on purpose to try to get him to buy the second volume later. Right for more. <laughs> yeah, you want all of them? All, Come on, have to pony music up. rights, as you well know as I do, make no sense to us. This whole music rights and copyrighted things i understand why copyrights and trademarks are in place but this whole rights to things is just sometimes it gets so complicated to try to keep up with now to be sure queen's music catalog is among the most valuable in the world with classics like we said bohemian rhapsody and our, and our on this day in history oh the big mega hit another one bites the dust which is probably my least favorite hit only because they played it over and over again but it's still a great song what a bass line uh radio gaga uh 39 somebody to love and you're my best friend name the queen hit i mean they had to, so many all of them uh, as well <laughs> as the uh, the big rock shakers, We Will Rock You and We Are the Champions. And the songs are globally popular and enormously lucrative, the article says. So, yeah, but a billion dollars speaks loudly if you think about it. Obviously, whether that 
<laughs> where that or not some is realistic de- is depends on what's included in it. Three sources tell Variety that the publishing assets of the band members, Brian May, Roger Taylor, John Deacon, and the estate of Freddie Mercury, all of whom are equal shareholders in Queen Productions Limited, are on the table, although others say they are not. The situation may or not be complicated by the fact that the group's songs were almost entirely written by individual members of the night uh, 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 individual members up to the song in 1982 Body Language album when they agreed to be collectively credited on each song no matter who wrote it. That's the point where they go, okay, well, we're just going to put we all wrote it after this song is released no matter who actually wrote it. They'll they'll put all of them together as a group. So again, music rights are complicated to say the least anything that has to do with intellectual property anything like the assets and things like that where you're trying to figure out well i'll license it for you to use in this but not that you can own it for this but not that and if you want to put it in your movie it's a different price but if you want to put it in a commercial it's a different price and you want to put it in a video game it's a different price i mean like there's i got involved in ip for a little bit when i was with ibm doing intellectual intellectual property agreements dude it's bananas (laughs) It's like they invented invented this whole idea like, hey, instead of you just owning my song, I'm going to say you can only own it for certain use or a certain amount of time or a certain, with the web, a certain number of hits. After that, you got to come back and renegotiate for a higher price. Like, what? What? Case in point, that's exactly what they did with the TV show WKRP in Cincinnati. It was about a radio station, one of my favorite shows growing up, loved the sitcom, one of the funniest shows ever made. But on the show, when it aired on CBS... They were at a radio station, so they would play, you know, you'd hear a Pink Floyd song playing, you'd hear a Led Zeppelin song, you'd hear, you know, whatever pop song, Earth, Wind, and Fire in the early 80s, whatever would be playing, late 70s, you'd hear them. Well, guess what? They only agreed to license those songs on WKRP, if I'm saying this right, if I remember it properly, in reruns. If you reran it on television, it's fine. You don't have to worry about it. But they found out when they wanted to release it on home DVD video or release it for home release... They lost the rights of almost 90% of those songs when they did it. And they had to go through on that first season release of that show and remove every song that they didn't have the rights to at that point and, yeah. re- and replace it with just some generic, trademark-free rock sound song with a or guitar player. Or something they may have been able to get real cheap. Right, but it, yeah, but it, was all, it wasn't any songs. They had to replace it because I had really, it. there's it was no all, songs? No, there's a couple of them that they didn't have a problem with with them playing, but... It affected the show. When I tried to watch it that way, I'm like, wait, I remember Pink Floyd playing here and Arthur Carlson making fun of it because there were dogs barking in the background <laughs> and they were making fun of it. Yeah, so I'm watching it. I'm like, wow, it really affected it. So they only released the first season of the show that way and then they stopped. A few years passed by. Then they finally secured, again, about, no, I think it was 98% of the songs they originally had for their box set of release. So there is still a couple of places in that new box set where they couldn't play a certain song. Mm. It's it's crazy. It's weird. Uh, heavy Metal. Remember that song? Remember the movie, Heavy mm-hmm. Metal, the animated movie? Mm-hmm. For years, that was in limbo. It couldn't come out on home video. It couldn't have a home video release because there were so many songs in that m- movie that they couldn't secure the rights from all the artists. Right. Uh, Stevie Nicks has a song in it. Uh, I can't remember who sings oh, the heavy Hagar. metal song. His Sammy Hagar. Yeah. They could not secure. They couldn't secure all of the song rights, and they couldn't bring it out. So everybody, all my friends who had a heavy me- copy of heavy metal, it was it was a VHS copy that someone had run off a sixteen millimeter print somewhere. It's like, hey, I got a copy of heavy metal. It was almost like the Star Wars holiday special. You could <laughs> never get it, but you could get a grainy copy of it on VHS, which had been copied forty five thousand times. Right, and the quality was bad, but. I understand they finally did it and it came out on DVD and Blu-ray. So, yeah, music. I understand if I was a music artist, I wouldn't want to be ripped off by whatever, you know, and have my music. Oh, you want to use my song for a Dr. Pepper commercial? Okay, I understand you, you got to pay me to do that because it's my song, you know, mm-hmm. the record company or whatever. But it's a thing that I would never be in and would never understand if I, never, if I ever got into it. Well, technically, your voice and your likeness can be yeah. sold. If somebody says, well, yes. we want to use the BK voice, they, they should be paying you. Yeah. And if it's yours, and I understand And then you can turn that. around, if you were really popular, you could say, well, you could use it for certain products, but right. not others. Right, right. Or it will cost you more. Like, if you want to use my voice for a sports franchise, it's gonna, right. you're going to have to pony up some cash because I don't just put my voice to sports for anything. One of them, and sometimes in the 70s, depending on when you grew up, there were times where you'd hear a song and it reminds you of, a, of it was so associated with a commercial. And one of, the, one of the ones I remember, we were just singing it over this weekend because the song by Carly Simon came 
came on the radio while we were taking our vacation. It's the song Anticipation by Carly Simon. Mm-hmm. And you, I think you remember the song. Mm-hmm. Anticipation. Yep. Well, in the 70s, that was used for the longest time for Heinz Ketchup. Because it was so it thick, so long it was pour. the anticipation, and they played it on the commercial, and I just identified that song with the ketchup for the longest time. Yep. Every time I'd hear it, I'd remind me of, I think it was Heinz, not Hunt's, yeah, Heinz ketchup. Yeah, so it was like, it was, it was so thick, you just anticipating it coming out, and it was so slow because it was so thick, so... Yeah, music rights. Yeah, I don't have so much of a problem here, but I got to watch it when I, I go to YouTube. Every time I hear the ELL song, <laughs> "Can't You Know, Don't Get Me Down." Oh, don't bring me down. Don't bring yeah. me down. Yeah, I, I see the Mick Ultra commercial about how well such a light beer you'll float away. Oh, because they play they play and, it in and, that one. Oh, it's a huge commercial for that. <laughs> yeah, you need to oh, look yeah, up Mick great. Ultra and "Don't Bring Me Down." Take a look at it. Oh, it's great. No, I've never heard it used in there, but I knew I identify it with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two opens with Mr. Blue Sky and put them back on the charts again, which is funny. And a movie will do that. It really will. Speaking of there, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll have more fun. And I got a Mad Max story about something that was real that I had no idea was. We will return after these messages. America, you don't have to run out of milk. If it's not around the house, it's just around the corner. Having a 7-Eleven store in the neighborhood is just like having your own refrigerator full up with cold, fresh milk. Right on the price, right around the corner, right there where you need it. Oh, thank heaven for 7-Eleven, your neighborhood dairy store. If it's not around the house, it's just around the corner at your 7-Eleven store. I'd like to talk to you about good things to eat, like Swiss cheese on a crisp, rich cracker, or a chunk of ham on a crisp, rich cracker. Mmm, peanut butter and jelly on a crisp, rich cracker. Everything tastes great when it sits on a Ritz. You hungry? Then have some onion dip on a crisp, rich cracker. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Good cracker. Good cracker. From Nabisco. Good cracker. Good, good cracker. Now don't forget a loaf of bread, a container of milk, and a stick of butter. If you can't remember, I'll write it down for you. That's okay, Mommy. I won't forget. I remember. A loaf of bread, a container of milk, and a stick of butter. A loaf of bread, a container of milk, and a stick of butter. A loaf of bread, a container of milk, and a stick of butter. A loaf of bread, a container of milk, and a stick of butter. A loaf of bread, a container of milk, and a stick of butter. A loaf of bread, a container of milk, and a stick of butter. Mister, could I have a loaf of bread, a container of milk, and, and, gee, I can't remember. Can you remember what my mommy said? A loaf of bread, a container of milk, and a stick of butter. A stick of butter. I remembered, I remembered. Mommy, mommy, I remember. A loaf of bread, a container of milk, and a stick of butter. You have a good memory, honey. Thank you, Mommy. From Sesame Street, if you want to hear more like that, go to Sesame Street's uh, wonderful YouTube channel they have. If you remember the little uh, shorts that they have, little animated shorts from Sesame Street, that's just one of them. It always stuck in my head with the with the very uh, weird animation with the jazzy sounding music in the background. It's like, oh, that's what jazz is? I didn't know that's <laughs> kind of jazzy stuff. As a kid, I never knew, but I'm like, oh, it did, did help me remember. I retraced my steps, and again, Sesame Street would trick you into... Uh, Doing learning the right stuff. thing and learning stuff. So, yeah, so it certainly tricked me. So, get a little nice nostalgic tidbit for you there. By the way, Chance called off the air and told me that uh, Batman had an episode, the old Batman series uh, had uh, an episode where they used the Johnny Carson theme of The Tonight Show in one of the episodes where him and, uh, mm-hmm. you ever seen the stills from when the one Batman and the Joker go surfing on the surfboard? Yeah. It was like a surf episode. And they in the background, they stopped at a snack bar on the beach and the jazz version of the Johnny Carson theme was playing and they had to remove it from home video releases or something like that. Another music rights that's <laughs> like, okay, that's crazy. And if you, I think if you have the, the original film prints of it or original air of it when you taped it off the air, it's still there. So just like, could w, you, could just you like WKRP. So I don't know. Could you? <laughs> Back in the 60s? Well, no, I think it's okay on the air now. When the, It's oh. always okay for air. 
if a, if a channel plays the reruns but not on any kind of home video release. You don't even release. know that anymore. Sometimes well, the yeah. license is for original Who run. Who knows? They had to release. You, t- you did, uh, when you filled in last week, you did Bosom Buddies, the TV show with Tom Hanks. Mm-hmm. They had to replace My Life by, uh, by Billy, uh, Billy Joel. Joel for that. And I think it was a different recording or a different song Wasn't altogether in some parts. the rumor Tom Hanks sang it? I don't know, was it? Did he do the redo? I thought you redo had said it? that once upon a time. That I don't there was the rumor, because nobody knows who really, I think, sang but it. I, I think, think the original it. version was the Billy Joel one or one close to it or whatever, but they didn't no, have the No, the original right song was Billy Joel, but yeah. the version used in Bosom Buddies, I they, thought you said was Tom they did not. They did not have the rights to do it, and uh, I wouldn't want to get bogged down in music rights for anything. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I had this story. I, told, I teased you with this at the break from SlashFilm.com. Mad Max Fury Road, which was just on again last night. I watched it again last night. It just Such to be an on. amazing I'm film. Like, I can't believe this amazing. movie. It's so amazing. One of the biggest miracles of the modern cinema, they call it, from Slash Film. This is a film that could have gone wrong so many times and actually kind of did in some places uh, when filming. But there, uh, where most of the stunt crew could have died several times over, a movie that, against all odds, not only got made, but it was as a perfect movie as it could be, at least just described by Slash Film here. And I, I would have to agree that it's really great. Um, not a lot of CGI in Fury Road. I mean, the storm in the background, the tornadic storm that they go through and the dust storm, that's mm-hmm. CGI. And some of the other stuff, they, I think they CGI'd out um, her arm because she was missing yeah. an arm. Fury Road. Well, I mean, the, 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 the typical things of stunt cables and some stuff. Of their stunts, but, it was just, they just moved the cables. They were still right. doing it. They were still right. real people still moving. Still practical effects. George Miller's masterpiece particularly perfected the art of visual storytelling, delivering a movie that works just as well <clears throat> without any dialogue, which it doesn't have a lot at the beginning and max barely speaks in it tom hardy until later a movie that tells you everything you need or would want to know about its world its people and its cultures with imagery rather than um any other thing another brief recap of the state of the world in the beginning and exposition is what they were showing you take what is probably the weirdest and coolest of the many side characters in the movie whom we understand without having to hear a single word from of dialogue from him here's one of them the Coma Doof Warrior. I don't even think they ever say his name in the film, but that's who he was. He was also known as the guy with the flamethrower guitar. Mm-hmm. That scene. Yep. It's an impossible character, one that shouldn't work, let alone be physically possible to film without CGI. And yet, the guitar was a practical prop and entirely functional, flames mm-hmm. and all. Yep. As production designer Colin Gibson told MTV News, but he won't anymore because MTV News is gone, uh, when the film came out, quote, George Miller, unfortunately, doesn't like things that don't work. I have in the past built him props that I thought were just supposed to be, you know, props. And then he comes up and goes, okay, plug it in now. <laughs> so if it works, and he goes, and yes, the flame-throwing guitar did have to operate, did have to play. The PA system did have to work. And the drummers. Unfortunately, I did get practice in all positions. And I've got to tell you, the drumming was very uncomfortable at 70 kilometers an hour eating <laughs> sand while we're filming the movie he said now as for the actual doof warrior character musician iota iota told audiences everywhere back in 2015 that the flamethrower was controlled by a whammy bar while the flames were real the music left a lot to be desired even though it did play it did play music so yeah mm-hmm. so there you go the the flame throwing guitar in mad max really played and was a real guitar and did blow flames what's out. crazy is i knew That's practical I, I knew that and i'm like what are you wh- <laughs> and i didn't know the, the details behind it though you it's don't like, want to wow. say drugs but what were you like what how did you, you envision i remember him talking about the polecats and he's like yeah. i went and oh, saw yeah. this like acrobatic thing like wouldn't it be cool if that'd be a way to kind of like siege from one vehicle sure, to another yeah, sure he goes but you know the physics behind it obviously <laughs> right. we couldn't do it yeah he goes then like i said that to somebody and then a few weeks later they come back like check this out and we got these pole cats moving back and forth and these guys <laughs> right. are like Woo-hoo-hoo. and they're doing it uh, that movie is just a feast for the eyes Yes, but it's such an amazing story underneath, and there's just it's it's got heart, it's yeah. got it's got and everything you want. In when, a movie. when I saw the trailer for it, and while they were going through filming it, and you heard about it, and you are like, "Oh, George Miller's doing another Mad Max." So many years later, uh, some people try to do that; they just can't do it. And I'm thinking, this is this might not be good. It might come out and just be the biggest flop in history. And when it came out, I was I was I had to go see it again because I was so just 
uh, the artistry of the film just affected me where I'm like, I got to go see that again. That was just a, it's just a piece of art the way this is put mm-hmm. together. And back when it came out, we talked about it on the air and I had the stats, but I don't have them with me now. The facts about how long it took to edit that movie together and what they had, how they worked on it, how he had teams working on it. Mm-hmm. And they were mostly on location for the whole movie. And it was in no, the, out in the middle of nowhere. A woman <laughs> who had never edited a film before. Wow. Yeah. That's she understood crazy. the See, I don't remember that. And every single vehicle had a GoPro in it to film to from film their the angle. I do remember that. She had 3,000 hours. 3,000 yeah. hours yeah. Of, foot, of footage to look through. They had to, to catch, the they shot had to you catch all, those, all that footage somehow <laughs> just to do it. That in, like That's worthy of an Academy Award just for the effort. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and considering George's age, man, he just went through right through it with no problem. And ready just to tackle his next project anytime it's ready to go. It's supposed to be well, a Furiosa. I love his direction. Furiosa, one thing uh, that you prequel. think in a film you're not supposed to do, he goes, I always want the center of attention to be in the center of the screen. Yeah. And he, and the people are like, well, that's not how you make movies. If someone's moving left to right, you want them off to the left so they've got all this visit <laughs> to the right. He goes, well, right. no, because it's going to be going like this, and I right. don't need the eye moving. I need the eye fixed, right. and everything happens right in you're, front of you're, me. It, like in life, your peripheral vision will see everything else on the side. And, and that's it's how true. You get it. Every Every shot, the main action is dead center. Yeah. You never have to yeah. take your eye off the screen. And he he was the one. I don't know if he was the first to do it, but he perfected at least with the first Road Warrior film, and then the second one, uh, um, the the um, the Road Warrior, which is actually Mad Max Two everywhere else in America in the world except for America. Because when we're, when when the Road Warrior was released, a lot of people had never heard of or seen Mad Max, so they're like, "We well, can't call it Mad Max Two. People in America don't know what it is. Right. It's a sequel." But it was, and uh, when you watch it, he he purposely places cameras. It, when you get the the point of view of the car going down the road, he'll put the camera below the bumper down at pavement level. So with the camera that close to the pavement, and you're only you can only do you can do like fifty miles an hour, and it seems like you're doing a hundred with the camera there, depending on how mm-hmm. you shoot it and what you do. It's kind of like Spielberg using the camera at water level in yeah. Jaws. It gives you that feeling of oh, I'm in the water, and it's claustrophobic, and there could be a shark, and it's horrible. There's a way to film things like that. And George Miller is a great director. I mean, he's had some bombs here and there and goofball parts, but he he directed, I for, I do forget this, but I do remember that he did it. He he directed the um the Twilight Zone segment with John Lithgow on the on the jet. Mm-hmm. That's the part, that's the one short that he directed in the film, and it's the best one. They saved it for last, and it's a remake of the Shatner episode seeing the Gremlin on the wing. But it is it is directed it's amazingly put together with it, with Rob Bottin's creature that he built, mm-hmm. that Craig Reardon and they built for the the practical creature on the on the set, and it looks very much more terrifying than the teddy bear looking one in the show because that's all they could use. It was weird looking, but not as that one looked oh, no. very the, the horrific. Twilight Zone, the movie, I was just like, movie. I understand why Lithgow was going mad because <laughs> I saw that too. I'd be like, nobody else sees it but me, really. But George Miller, he's a he's a great director. I did not see his latest movie. That came out. Uh, the the movie about where uh, Edris Elba plays the genie. What was it called? Oh, I forgot. With uh, the girl that plays in Doctor Strange as the as the. Did that already come the, out? Yeah, it already came out and went. Uh, came and went. Now I got to look up the I got to look up the title. What was it called? Because it Cause looked I want to see it. Visually, looked George Miller. Cr- yeah, like a little. It, yeah, there you go. It had a George Miller look to it. But what was it called? As I look here, sorry, I want to uh, put something I, on the line. Uh, I am. Um, my memory banks but are he malfunctioning. was a genie and she met him and started making wishes and stuff and it was called i can only pull it up here got it got it got it if only we had a computer and we do have one here it is <laughs> do we Three Thousand years of longing that's the name of it i don't think it did very well what was the box office on it it was uh, a budget of 60 million dollars it made 20 Oops. ouch that was bad but Coming up on his uh, calendar for 2024 is Furiosa, the, the prequel. Prequel, pre, pre the prequel of uh, that character played by Anna Taylor Joy. I think yep, is Anna her Taylor name. Anna Taylor Joy. Speak here on the air. Thanks for being with us today. Catch us on the podcast. We'll be next week. I'm glad to be back from vacation. See you then. Bye. That message. Some people never learn, but Professor Irwin certainly learned something today. He was so worried about looking good in front of others, he presented a car to the public that he knew was dangerous. Right. And he learned the most important lesson of all. It's not what other people think about us that's important. What's important is doing what is right. I learned a lot too, Kate Crusaders. Next time Robin cooks supper, I'm eating out.